Good morning, everyone. My name is Betsy Cooper, and I'm the director of the Aspen Tech Policy Hub, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to the next webinar in our series. Uh, democracy is the focus of what we'll be talking about today, and it's at the intersection of many difficult issues that, uh, related to technology and society, not least our election system, how do we access and help vulnerable populations, and how do we think about giving people who currently don't have the opportunity to participate more opportunities to do so. So this is a really important moment to be talking about these issues, and I'm thrilled that we have not one, not two, but three amazing fellow products that we'll be releasing for you today. And that will be followed by a keynote speech by Justice Mariano Florentino Cuellar, which I'm extremely honored to introduce to you later. But first, some logistical announcements. Uh, if you're interested in asking a question of any of our panelists, please submit that in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We'll be collecting questions throughout and we'll make sure to leave plenty of time for those at the end. And then also check the chat function because there we'll be posting live links to the fellows projects as we release them. So you can take a look at what they've built in real time. So first, I'm very excited to introduce Matthew Volk and Elizabeth Allendorf. Matthew is a software engineer tackling misinformation and elections integrity, and Elizabeth is an AI engineer at Northrop Grumman, passionate about AI ethics. Their project is focused on combating election disinformation, you know, really not timely topic here. Um, we're very excited to release their project today. Over to you to tell us all about it, Matt and Elizabeth. Great, thank you so much, Betsy. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Allendorf. So glad you're here today. And here today, we're going to be talking about how we can fight back against online disinformation via online dark ads. Um, to do that, we're first going to get into things by setting the stage about the current state of online political advertising. So in case you didn't know, there are a lot of online political ads. In the summer of 2018 alone, there were 1.3 million unique online political ads run on just the top three platforms in the US, and that's Facebook, Google, and Twitter. And that was just a summer. What's really interesting though, is how much did those 1.3 million ads cost? Um, as it turns out, those 1.3 million ads were viewed up to 33.8 billion times, which is a lot. Um, and it only cost them a bargain $300 million. And if you do the math, that's about a little bit less than a penny per set of eyeballs, which is quite a good deal. And again, this was just in summer 2018. So what do we expect to happen for the 2020 election cycle? Well, the projected 2020 online political ad spending is $1.34 billion, which is quite a lot of pennies. Um, and so, and that's enough to reach each registered voter in the US around a thousand times. And so when Matt and I saw that number, we thought, okay, well, how much um, did it cost? And who are buying all these ads? The problem is that it's really hard to tell who's buying all these ads. Um, it turns out that recently over half of Facebook pages hid their backers against, against company policy, making attribution nearly impossible. And that means that given current gaps in online political advertising rules, it's hard to even know if you're being advertised to in the first place, let alone who paid for the ad. Um, and we call ads like this that hide their backers dark ads. So what do we define a dark ad as? Uh, the definition that we use is that it's a piece of paid advertising content not explicitly labeled or reported as paid for. Um, and we believe that you should have the right to know the answer to three questions about these ads. First, is it an ad? Secondly, who paid for the ad? And third, why is it being shown to me? And in this presentation, we're going to be talking about those three rights and some examples of why it's so important to have them. Um, and that's the focus of our project, which is the Nightlight Project. And the goal of the Nightlight Project is to hold spreaders of online disinformation accountable. So now we're going to outline why we believe these three rights are so important with the help of a, free, a few real life examples. And I'm gonna hand it over to my partner, Matt. Thanks, Elizabeth. So let's get started with our first right, the right to know whether we're being advertised to in the first place. As an example, we'll use the dark advertising practice of misleading influencer endorsement. Here, we have a post from the popular Instagram account, Kale Salad. I know it sounds dumb, but they have 4 million followers, so bear with me. The Bloomberg campaign sent them a message asking to post a meme on their page, and they even made a joke about paying the account a billion dollars to do so. Kale Salad screenshotted this message and posted it. It attracted almost 90,000 likes from its young following. With this, the Bloomberg campaign was one of the first to successfully turn a political ad 
into a meme. And because it's just a meme, it's really easy to mistake it as a joke. But we can't forget that this was part of a carefully crafted advertising campaign. The Bloomberg campaign actually paid over 500 popular accounts just like this one to promote itself, and it reached an estimated 60 million Americans by doing so. This represents up to a third of the American electorate. But because these memes don't meet federal definitions of political advertising, it's exempt from all reporting and transparency laws. Without this reporting, you can be advertised to without even knowing it. We believe this is fundamentally wrong. On to our second question. We deserve to know who paid to advertise to us. As our example, we'll use the dark advertising practice of misleading direct messaging campaigns. Here, we have unsolicited text messages from the Biden and Trump campaigns. The messages on the right actively spread disinformation about Nancy Pelosi. We'll never know the full extent of people who received these messages or what they contained because they're not reported anywhere. Unfortunately, this is common practice too. In 2018, political campaigns purchased 94 million phone numbers without user consent. Again, this represents around two thirds of the American electorate. They then used online platforms to micro-target over 350 million messages to users. Voters definitely deserve to know who got their information, if those people are who they claim to be in the first place, and what their motivations are. Without disclosure though, advertisers can't be held legally accountable for the content they sent out. Under current regulation, advertisers aren't required to explicitly disclose anything because these aren't treated as ads. The government can't hold them accountable because nothing gets reported. And last, our last right is to know why we're seeing what we're seeing. To illustrate it, we'll use the dark advertising practice of hyper-targeted ephemeral ads. These three advertisements were all run at the same time, but they're treated as one ad. The advertisers tweak small things on these ads to appeal to different demographics differently. It's easy to change just a couple of words or a background picture to make it more relevant to the reader and maliciously to prevent, present different messages to different people. This technique was widely used by the Republican National Committee in 2016. In fact, they don't run ads with three variants like this one. They ran one with 175,000 different versions, but only reported one. This ad was run the night before the October 2016 presidential debate. The RNC routinely ran dark ads with 40 to 50,000 versions, but this practice isn't unique to them. It's common practice. Currently, advertisers don't need to report the vast majority of these because they're treated as one ad, so it's impossible to know who saw what and why. Without disclosure, advertisers can completely control the narrative. They can present different sides of the story to different people and get away with it. We believe you deserve to know what side of the story you're being presented based on information advertisers have on you, and we believe advertisers should be held accountable for this practice. So let's pause a second. That was a lot, and that was only three kinds of dark ads. You might be wondering, how is all of this even legal in the first place? Well, the Federal Election Commission, or FEC, is responsible for regulating political ads. In general, they do a great job. Unfortunately though, they last updated their online political ad rules in, you guessed it, 2006. Obviously the internet has changed a lot since then. For context, this is what Facebook looked like then. It was only two years old. And in fact, they didn't even hire their first intern until later that year. So we wrote some policy proposals to help address some of these gaps. For each problem, we presented a regulatory solution. First, there's the question of ma marking political ads as ads. Remember the Bloomberg memes? To fix this, the FEC should require advertisers to provide disclaimers on all political ads. Think, my name is candidate X and I endorse this message, but now online too. This would make it impossible to mislead via influencer endorsements, direct messaging campaigns, and the like. Second, we need more transparency about who funds which ads. Think of the mass texting campaigns. To fix this, the FEC should require all political advertisers to disclose their funders on all advertisements that they run, just like they already require for TV and radio ads. This makes it harder for advertisers to lie or to present different sides of the same issue to different people while online. Lastly, we believe voters deserve to know why they're seeing political ads in the first place. Think of that ad with 175,000 different versions and how you would never know which version you were seeing or why. To fix this, the FEC should encourage online advertisers to report targeting information on all ads that they run. This would shine a light on malicious hyper-targeting so the public can be aware of two-faced advertisers. 
there's already a bipartisan Senate bill that would make reporting targeting information mandatory, and we provide some draft regulations for it. All right, with all of that, back to you, Elizabeth. Great, thanks, Matt. So we encourage you to visit our website so that you can check out all of the work that we've done. Um, like Matt said, we created a suite of draft regulation changes that you can read about in further detail there. In these policy briefs, we walk through several types of dark ads and suggest regulatory changes that could shine a light on them. We propose several changes that could be implemented right now by the FEC without an act of Congress. And we also provide draft regulations to, for the two up and coming bipartisan Senate bills to show what could be possible with congressional action. But maybe that's too much reading for you. I get it. Sometimes you're busy, you just want to do something fun. Um, and that's why we created our dark ads game. If you're interested in dark ads and maybe don't want to read all these policy suggestions, we created this game to help you understand what dark ads are in a fun way. And the game is a simulated social media feed where you, we created to demonstrate how difficult it can be to find dark ads and disinformation online. And the reason that we created this is because while Matt and I were doing research for this project, we realized it was difficult even for us to be able to determine what was a dark ad and what wasn't. And so we wanted to create something that would let us share this feeling with you. So in the game, you can play as one of three users, a student, a nine to five worker, or a grandparent, and their social media feed will change depending on the character that you select. And when you go through this, uh, the social media feed, you'll be able to see a number of posts from friends and family and ads and even just silly posts about animals liking each other. And we want you to see if you can try to guess what's a dark ad and what's disinformation. And I think you'll find that it's a lot harder than you would expect. But we think it's still a really fun way to learn about dark ads and we really hope you check it out. After the game, you might be feeling a little bit discouraged, like, oh gosh, how could I ever have a chance of catching dark ads in real life? Well, fear not, we created a tip sheet that, you can, uh, that can assist you in the real world in catching dark ads. Um, so we recommend that you print it out and share it with your friends and family to spread the message. Our website, again, has all of these solutions. It has the game, it has the tip sheet, and it has some general information and ways to contact us if you have any questions. And so we hope you check it out. It's live right now. So in conclusion, thank you so much for coming today. Um, we would like to give a special thank you for research support from these organizations. And we'd also like to thank uh, our fellows who helped out, Matt Sievers and Cecilia Crum, for their support on this project. And we'd also like to thank our project mentor, Vivian Schiller, who's the Executive Director of Aspen Digital. And we hope you enjoy the rest of the presentations today. Back to you, Betsy. Thanks so much, Elizabeth and Matt. Um, I think uh, if you were paying at all any attention, you've seen just how important and timely this topic is, just how practical the things our fellows built are, and they even managed to make it fun. Uh, but so I really encourage you to go to our website and take a look at their products, play the game, understand some of the issues with what we see online, and think about how to get engaged so that you can actually make a difference in uh, changing the way that these dark ads are regulated. Um, so I do want to remind you that if you have any questions for our fellows uh, or for any of the panelists here, please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we'll get to questions uh, towards the end of this webinar. So uh, switching gears a bit, I next want to introduce Jessica Cole. Uh, she's on the leadership team for the U.S. Digital Response, which is an organization matching pro bono tech support with governments in need of, uh, of services in light of COVID-19. So governments, if you're listening right now, uh, here's a great opportunity at U.S. Digital Response uh, to get some help uh, for some of the technology issues you may be facing. Uh, Jessica was formerly the head of innovation at the city of Walnut Creek, and she's really interested in automated advocates and how we can uh, enable us to improve our legal systems uh, using new technology. So uh, we're excited to release her products today. Over to you, Jessica, to tell us more. Thank you so much, Betsy. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you, Matt. And Elizabeth both talked a little bit about the ways that technology can be used to obfuscate or obscure things on your behalf. I'm actually going to flip it a little bit today and talk about the ways that you should expect technology to work for you. But first I'm going to do a little something that people don't often do on video, which is ask you for a moment to close your eyes. I'd like you to imagine being someone who is a tenant and wakes up tomorrow to a message from your landlord that tells you that you only have a few weeks before you're being evicted. What would you do in this circumstance? Okay, open your eyes. If you're like many people, your first thought was, 
I might actually want to get some legal advice on this. And maybe I actually have a right to because if I'm going to go to court, we might have a right to be state sponsored represent represented by someone. Unfortunately, that right to be represented by someone that might be state sponsored only applies to criminal courts. So if instead you want legal representation in a civil court, which in this case actually applies to many of the most critical services you might want to have access to, like avoiding eviction, determining custody, or appealing benefit access, you are not going to necessarily be able to access it without paying. That means that more than 80% of people cannot actually, who are low income, cannot actually afford accessible, affordable legal help in the United States today. And lest you think this can be solved with pro bono, which is a wonderful element of our legal system, even today the Legal Services Corporation estimates that for every one person that's helped by one of the organizations they fund for legal aid, another person gets turned away due to lack of resources. Now, this as a technologist is a perfect moment to say, how can we use technology to actually more highly leverage the humans, the lawyers who are in the system, by taking away some of the administrative tasks that otherwise would fall on people who are seeking legal advice or seeking to provide that legal advice. And to give you a little bit of background on why I care about this, so my background is as a civic technologist. Through the years, I've worked on startups in the civic space. I've worked as a fellow at the nonprofit Code for, Mer for America. And I've also worked in government for several years, trying to figure out how to innovate from within. The challenge I kept coming up with time and time again was, we have great technology in the world, but the technology we have tends to work better for us as consumers than it does for us as citizens. So if you are going online and doing a Google search, for coupons that can automate the discounts that you'll get on your coffee maker, you're more likely to find help with that than a tool that can actually automate away some of the burden of applying for unemployment benefits. So let's zoom back into the civil legal space, which is the kind of motivating question for this project. How should we be providing as policymakers more opportunities for technology to help close this civil access to justice gap? And this is not an easy problem. It's a problem space that many people have been playing in for a long time. And three of the challenges are articulated here. The first core challenge in trying to approach this work is regulatory. So in many, many states, the states actually use rules that descend from the American Bar Association that define who and what can be involved in giving legal advice. At this time, in most states, this is li limited to actual lawyers who have passed the bar, are the ones who can give legal advice and who can actually own a law practice. The challenge here is that not only does that mean that technology tools cannot be used to provide legal advice, even when we have a huge gap in the market, they also are scared to enter the market to begin with because if there's an, even a chance that they could be held to account for providing some form of legal advice, they don't want to take that risk. The second challenge that we see is a market one. So think about it as an entrepreneur, even if you're an entrepreneur for good building a nonprofit tool. If you're thinking about the legal market, not only is it a little bit intimidating to enter, but it differs a ton based on where you're located. So there are some federal laws that expand across the entire country, but there are also distinct sets of state laws and even county level laws and local level laws that you need to take into account anytime that you're building a tool. This means you need to build something fairly custom instead of something that you could see scaling. Finally, there's a, what I call a fiduciary challenge, and this is what some might call a sniff test. So when you think of technology and new tools coming into the market, a lot of people in the field have nerves around the idea of whether or not those tools are representing you accurately and fairly and with your best interest in mind. So when you turn to a fiduciary in another field, for example, you trust them to represent you with your best interests at the heart and not theirs. So the kind of core challenge when it comes to introducing new technology into the legal space is how do we gain the benefits of having a fiduciary type uh, organization while frankly building a technology tool that can scale across the entire market. So as I mentioned, a lot of people have been doing work in the space. This presentation and the work at Aspen has been built on top of an enormous field around access to justice. The specific area that we focused on as part of our team was figuring out how we can help the legal field define a category of the types of tools they would like to see. The ones that would be helpful, would not violate rules, and would also be able to openly show that they have the citizens' best interests at heart. 
So the first solution that we came up with was to name and define a new category of tools for people to engage with. And we call those tools automated advocates. Let me break this down. So an automated advocate is a tool that both automates and advocates. On the automation side, it uses automation to actually make a, what would otherwise be a manual process, much quicker and easier. That could be as simple for someone as they fill out and answer questions in an in interactive chat, and it automatically goes and fills out all of the many PDFs that they would otherwise have to fill by hand in the form fields. Then, after it helps relieve some of the administrative burden on that side, it advocates for users at scale. And what I mean by this is that a technology tool can actually observe and make legible what the user experience is one by one at a higher level of scale than otherwise might be able to be done. They can say, hey, we filled out forms and assisted 5,000 people in trying to appeal their benefits and 80% of them got stuck at this one step. Maybe as a system, we should relook at the way we phrase that step or the requirements we have there because if we want someone to be able to complete the process, we are seeing that the data doesn't support them being able to do that right now. So that's the idea of an automated advocate. And as part of this project, we actually identified case studies of automated advocate style tools that already exist in the market today. So one that those who know the legal field might be familiar with is a tool called Upsolve. Upsolve is a nonprofit. They actually help people file for personal bankruptcy. And traditionally, filing for personal bankruptcy costs people thousands of dollars, which you might imagine they don't have in the moment they're going to file for personal bankruptcy. Upsolve coaches them through that process uses tech, using technology. It automatically completes some of the steps for them. And then it actually kicks them to a lawyer for any legal oversight and guidance they might need in order to take the next step. They have helped to clear more than $50 million of personal debt and counting. Uh, and as part of that, they also do regular reports back to the system on how they're doing and on things that bankruptcy courts can in general do to make this process easier for others. You can go to our project and see some other case studies that we've identified from across the civic tech and legal tech field. The other thing that we did as part of this project was actually identify nine core design principles for what makes something an automated advocate. So what are the nine ways that if you're a builder, you want to follow the rules so that if you follow these principles, you are likely to build something that acts in the public interest. On the flip side, we also included questions for regulators to be able to ask of people who are applying to use automated advocate style tools to show that they are in fact good actors and ethical actors in the space. The second solution we focused on was getting technologists to recognize that they should be supporting regulatory sandbox style experimentation that's happening in courts today. So right now, a series of states have, have realized that if they leave things at the status quo, as we mentioned, there simply will not be enough lawyers to provide the level of legal help that's needed in the civil legal system. This is a crisis. And so several states have either launched or are contemplating launching what they call a regulatory sandbox. This is a sandbox where for a series of years, applicants can actually apply to waive particular reg regulations like who's allowed to give legal advice or who's allowed to co-own an individual law firm. And as part of that, they can then operate in the clear while conversing with regulators about what's working and what's not. And at the end of that time, only then do regulators think about what could or should we open up in the future. So through this project, we actually drafted memos to regulatory sandbox uh, teams who are considering this in both California and in Utah. Finally, this, comes, this is a challenge where we equally want to get the regulations right and it's a double-sided marketplace. We want people to want to participate in building automated advocates. So we drafted sample requests for startups, pulling a page out of the Silicon Valley textbook around uh, actually soliciting the types of startups we might want to see. We drafted a, way, a template that can be used by any state to create a request for startups for their local area. And we specifically talked about what states should be providing for these startups, like potentially asking them what individual laws they should make machine readable for them to scale so that it's a two-way dialogue and more startups want to participate in the process. Finally, I just want to acknowledge, again, this was built on top of a, an immense amount of conversations, and it was also built in partnership with Raylene and Nidhi, who are my Aspen Fellow co-contributors to this project, and that this work has never been so important. With COVID-19, we are seeing a record number 
of cases in the civil legal field. And we're going to see, just like technology policy builds one on top of the other, we're going to see the records of what happens today for a long period of time in ways that will monumentally impact people's lives. So I encourage you to go to automatedadvocates.org to check out the project and to think about the ways that we should be making technology work for us. Thank you, and I'll go back to you, Betsy. Thanks so much, Jess. A wonderful presentation. And as you can see, really important area, especially in light of all the changes occurring with COVID-19, where it's much harder to have in-person legal engagements. And so now we need to think about new ways that we can engage uh, individuals. And so Jessica's project really starts to speak to that. Uh, again, I'll remind you that if you have any questions for Jessica or any of our other fellows, you can use the Q&A box and you can check out her project, which is now live by following the link in our chat uh, window below. So please uh, have a look and uh, start learning more about Automated Advocates. Last but not least, I'm really pleased to introduce Amy Wilson. Um, she's the former director of Mach 37, a cybersecurity startup accelerator. And she's also the author of a forthcoming book, Empathy for Change, which is scheduled to be released this fall. So make sure to check that book out uh, when you have the chance. But today she's going to be talking about people powered policy and how to improve democracy in communities such as Oakland, California, uh, where I currently live, we're excited to see uh, all the work that she's done in this space. And so now over to you to share more, Amy. Well, thank you, Betsy. And this is a really important topic. So thank you um, for everyone for joining us today and um, my fellow panelists as well. I'm going to share my screen. So um, I wanted to, what I wanted to talk about today is like while researching the book that I, you just referenced on empathy, for change, I became really interested in how do, do governments create more equity and empathy in, um, with people at the center. And so I was particularly inspired by an organization that's called Creative Reaction Lab, um, which believes that systems of oppression have been designed so we can redesign these systems um, with empathy, humility, and equity at its center. Um, so the first I want to talk before I begin on, on the difference between equality and equity. Um, equality is when you treat people um, and groups the same, but equity is when um, I might treat different groups differently so that the outcomes are the same for all people involved. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit of background on the, the, the research that we did, our findings, and also go into our approaches as well. So let me talk a little bit about um, the background. We chose Oakland, California for this study. Um, since it's right next door to San Francisco, some of the challenges of the city of San Francisco is spilling over to Oakland, like the technology boom, a lot of technology companies are now moving over to Oakland, um, and affordable housing shortages that come with it, and um, a lot of um, people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, it's a town full of rich history and activism and progressive thoughts and thinking. Um, and also my co-collaborator, Mariah Lichtenstern, um, is native to the city and has deep roots in, the, in it as well. And so we really thought that, you know, um, we can bring our, our, all our, our plans to bear um, to, to work in this challenge um, in, this, in the city. But we've also found some troubling trends as well. So here is a graph of Oakland um, around uh, 2007 in the last um, economic downturn. And uh, what you see here is all the red dots are, um, are individual houses in which foreclosures happened. Um, you can see that in a lot of different areas in the places where there's red spaces, there's a lot of foreclosures happening. That is called um, the flatlands um, of East and West Oakland in particular. Um, and then you also see um, the areas that are in green and blue are, all, are known as the, as the hills. And in the hills are the more affluent um, and typically uh, white um, um, people who live in these hills out there. Um, but what's interesting is that the city of Oakland um, did equity indicators and rated themselves with the idea of equity behind it, a 33.5 out of 100, which is not too great. 
Um, and so there's a lot of room to grow. But these areas, especially that are um, in the red area, it really shows the uh, effects of redlining in the city, um, which is a sense of practices that have been used to segregate different neighborhoods of white and um, black and brown neighborhoods as well. So um, there's like in these areas, um, uh, independent study saw that this, these areas experienced 28% poverty, high unemployment, um, low level of bachelor's degrees and a low medium in income. So here's another, um, some more data that shows um, on the left-hand side, 2013, um, the median household, household income for the city of Oakland and how, how just in four years, the, the city is changing so rapidly and something that we have to kind of get, get ahead as we move forward. Um, in, in a study um, that uh, independent group out of Oakland um, started started doing, doing the research and they found that um, that res the residents in the flatlands um, believe that these are the most cited items that they're concerned with, um, you know, housing, public safety, neighborhood services. Um, and then we, um, so to look into the, the findings as we move forward, um, let's look into that. So we asked this question about how might technology shift power to residents most impacted by systemic racism to sh shape local policy on race and equity. So we're looking at um, the, the interplay between um, the, those in the flatlands and the hills out there. Um, so we, we believe that the way to do this is to have better two-way dialogue um, and digital relationship between the government and its residents. Um, because when we found, did our research, we found a disconnect between the most underserved communities and the policies in, in City Hall. Uh, we spoke to ne nearly 50 people from all across Oakland um, and these are some of the quotes that we had in our research. Um, it's especially hard to find council members to get on the City Council agenda and it's really hard for people to participate in local democracy for various reasons and here's a few in, in here. Um, and this is most eloquently stated by one of our interviewees, Candace Elder from East Oakland, where she stated that civic involvement is a privilege for those who have ample time and resources. And, um, and also, when we were doing this research at the beginning of 2020, um, we were doing it before two major turning points that were happening in this country. Number one, uh, the coronavirus, um, which is, is forcing us all to be at home with our loved ones and, um, and out wearing masks um, and scared about, you know, interacting with people and going to places like City Hall. And then also we talk about the civil unrest and the peaceful protests that are happening in cities all around the country and even the world. Um, and that makes this, these two occurrences make it even more challenging and important and necessary to enhance digital engagement with residents um, to make sure the policies work for all residents and not just a few. So um, to tell you a little bit about the strategy and our approach as we go forward, we really, at the end of the day, want to create policy that is most equitable for all people within a local jurisdiction. Um, so we, we think about it in one side, we see is a key strategy is helping the city of Oakland prepare and understand what residents need in the first place. So, um, you know, like the research I've been doing here and elsewhere, we're trying to have more equity and empathy centered mindset. Um, we're also helping to prepare the workforce and council for this digital future. Um, and many organizations, you know, my experience working in civic tech as well at the White House um, as an entrepreneur in residence, um, I have a wealth of knowledge that like I wanna bring to bear in this experience. Um, and then also a key action is having a website and online digital platform where you can have that two-way communication, where you can hear the stories from people. And it's not just collecting hard data, but having that, that the other data that really helps um, you understand how to shape policy that meets different um, needs of the people out there. So setting priority areas and then helping to prototype and co-create with the community is really important here. Um, so in order to do that, we put together a number of documents, um, you know, outputs. We have a backgrounder on how might um, a city like Oakland or any local government um, 
focus on digital services and ec with equity at the, at the heart of it. Um, a really great step-by-step -step guide that's already being used by a number of people that I've come across. They're like, oh, how might I do virtual participation? Um, and even like looking at a very specific area on like how might I create this virtual participation in a, in a moment in time in the Zoom, one Zoom call. Um, and, and one of the things that I think is really um, galvanizing this whole experience is the, this policy brief where we actually lay out a three-part plan on how might you take a local government and make sure equity is at the center um, and, and build it out and, and really, really meet, meet the needs of different people out there. Um, and then we have the infographics, which I'm going to go into a little bit more detail in the next few slides about infographics. Um, form updates on um, for the city of Oakland and also I will show you the website. Um, so here's a couple infographics. It's hard to see them right here, but I'm, I'm, I'd be happy for you to take a look at the, the, them in the next, uh, in, the, in the link that has been put into the chat window. Um, on the left hand side, you see that it takes, we, we counted it, it takes 17 steps to do, um, to put an agenda item on the council um, on the city council in the city of Oakland. And that, and that involves a lot of back and forth. Um, and so what we did on the right-hand side was to rethink how that price process might be done with automation, but also how might we make those steps a lot shorter for people. So these are the infographics and the steps along the way. Um, we also have a website um, where we are showing, um, but there is an add an agenda form that's att attached to those um, infographics and we really um, streamlined that put it online so that you can have an example of like this can be a lot more automated than just um, having to put it on your computer print it out and then emailing it to somebody um, and also as we did our research we found out that information request is really important as well um, and so here is uh, what uh, People Power Policy, our website um, uh, example is. Uh, we've got topic and theme, a place where we can have people understand uh, the needs of, um, of different people. This is what you're seeing here is our community view. Um, this is where they can understand and engage so people can post a thought a question, um, a story, or take a poll, um, and then see right there what is out there for, um, for their consumption. So you can see um, a community feed, you can, um, you can see what people are saying on social media and the other information that's here. And this is the dashboard for the city um, so they can see on their end, uh, what is social media saying? What are the polls saying? What is the sentiment analysis um, coming back and get real time resident thoughts? Um, we also have the community portal engagement. Um, so you can see what stories, thoughts and questions are coming out. And also really importantly, um, the organizations, what are the, the reports that are coming from um, advocacy organizations out there as well? So um, to, to wrap this all together, we actually um, created a number of um, advocacy outputs as well, create an op-ed that we're going to be um, publishing soon in, um, in a local newspaper. We also have an operational plan on actually if we were to create this site, um, what is that plan from soup to nuts um, on how might we do this and do it on a, at a low cost so that we can engage the community um, and do it because of all the budget shortfalls that we know are coming with coronavirus. So I want to give some quick thanks to um, my co-conspirator Mariah Lichtenstern um, and then also we have Myling Garcia um, who is our um, wonderful mentor. She's the former leader of digital engagement in Oakland but also now is the director of digital engagement in the city of San Francisco. Um, and so what I wanted to do um, to say after this project and uh, our current state of affairs in this country is that there's a quite a few things that we need to face and um, local governments are great testing beds for innovation and change. So I've always been inspired by this James Baldwin quote and I thought it was very fitting um, to end with this that we really have to face these change, changes as we go forward um, because it's imperative for all of us um, to have a better world. So thank you.
Thanks so much, Amy. Uh, we're so excited to have your project uh, finally released and out there. And so uh, regardless of where you are, whether you're in Oakland or not, this is a great testing bed for how we can encourage better participation in local government. And we really encourage you to check that out on our website, um, which has just gone live. So now I'm extremely excited to introduce our keynote speaker, Justice Mariano Florentino Cuellar. He's a California Supreme Court Justice, a former Stanford professor, and one of the true leaders in the judiciary focused on the intersection of technology and the law. Um, if you have had any interaction with the judiciary, there are many who are not so familiar with technology, and so we're extremely excited uh, to have uh, one of the leaders in this space speak to us today. I could not think of a more appropriate keynote, and so I'm extremely excited uh, to have Justice Cuellar share some thoughts on what's been presented so far this morning. Over to you, Justice Cuellar. Thank you, Betsy, and thank you all our terrific presenters today. I was very impressed and fascinated by what people presented today. I also want to give a shout out to Betsy, not only to you and your colleagues, but to the Aspen Institute for trying to do this. I'm always happy to see how California is recognized by people as a hub for innovation and progress and um, original and creative thinking in this area. So having this um, hub set up and seeing it go from sort of back of the envelope sketch into a reality with fellows and seeing it actually be resilient relative to the difficulties we're facing right now on public health is, is encouraging. So I love these projects. I have a lot of ideas about them. I want to just mostly use my time to go big picture to give some context for this discussion to maybe draw together a few threads that cut across the different projects but also to remind us of some things that most of us already know but i think are worth highlighting in the conversation a year ago i would have uh, loved the idea of giving these remarks in front of many of you some of you would be still joining us remotely but it would be probably us sitting around the table or maybe in some conference room or space but it's really striking and daunting and thought provoking that a tiny virus, way smaller than a speck of dust, has largely brought our beautiful and resilient state and even our country almost to its knees. And it um, cannot escape us then that we're living in this moment of tragedy, difficulty, economically, it's devastating the livelihoods of people across the country and the world. And in terms of public health, many of us have lost people we know or we're very close to people who have faced that tragedy. But we're also coming together as these projects remind us because we're living in what I would call an age of miracles. And our gathering today along with these projects gives us a chance to reflect on the implications of those miracles for democracy. So let me highlight three of them that are pretty familiar, but almost have like a Baroque quality if you step back a little and realize what we take for granted. We have this extraordinary access to networks of knowledge that remain functional when disrupted and even repair themselves. Think about the way Wikipedia works when a page is vandalized, for example, or how the internet operates when traffic gets rerouted because one set of nodes doesn't work and another one becomes more desirable for the network. We have an almost instant access to information about anything we desire. Some of the presentations today remind us that that access comes at a price and the information is not always accurate or transparent, nor is it always easy for people to consume that information when they face daunting challenges in their own lives. But nonetheless, that access to information is um, incredibly seductive, extraordinary when you think about what some of us grew up with and, and actually even some of us experienced even just 15, 20 years ago. And we are building a kind of community on screen right now in ways that would have been difficult to imagine even six months ago. And that is a form of community that is adaptable, it can be scaled, it can be changed, it can be repurposed. So I think about that and I'm inspired. I think about more miracles that lie on the horizon. Machines with enough linguistic ability, a simulated linguistic ability that they can play that advocacy role that we were talking about in one of the presentations in new ways by sustaining conversations that many of us would think about as being interesting and that have very personalized bespoke responses to people. Also personalized education, medical treatment, the gamification of work in ways that can make it engaging and interesting to people in new ways. But um, I also think about how these projects are identifying 
real difficulties that we have in making the most of those uh, promises that this technology offers. And I think about how those difficulties really are pervasive at the same time that I think about how much we need to help. We need the help around elections, digital evidence, education for youth and adults, mental health, public diplomacy, foreign affairs. These are all domains that are defined by a lack of even distribution of expertise or wealth or ease of access to services. And uh, I see these projects as really trying to close that gap. So one thing I'd like us to do as we talk about these projects and think about their implications in our lives is to think in budget, organizational, and legal terms. To ask ourselves, what would it take to scale up these projects in a world that is imperfect, flawed, complicated, where agency problems, and I don't just mean problems of bureaucracy, but problems involving the level of trust we might have in a particular app or software system to actually reflect our desires or our interests are pretty pervasive, and where political economy problems are pervasive too where things that we think should happen, like the FEC changing certain approaches it takes to regulating elections become extremely difficult to do because we live in a world that's kind of imperfect, flawed, and frustrating. So, um, so I would say that that conversation would be helpful just to close then by taking into account a couple of themes that I think really apply to every one of the projects that we have heard about today. The first is that technology that we should continue to recognize that technology can enhance civic life, but also putting uh, it at risk at the same time. And that we're on the verge of much more complicated, difficult problems involving deep fakes, the explosion of carefully targeted, artificially generated content that is gonna make these ads as we were described um, here in, in politics, not only have 175,000 possible permutations, but millions, if not billions. We are living in a world that sometimes teeters between what I would call a first best world where there are very few practical or political constraints and a third best world where we're pervasively facing problems in civic engagement, inequality that carries over to these um, uses of technology. Just to give you an example, access to justice in a first best world might be very people-based. We would expect attorneys to be easily available for people who need them. That's so definitively not the world we live in. And in a third best world, we're probably going to have to depend on very imperfect technologies, even ones that are more promising than the ones that were showcased today, but ones that might not be as good as the thoughtful, bespoke, articulate, experienced lawyer that would be ideal. Another example is how lowering the cost of civic engagement, as we've heard about today, might be helpful for people who are facing pervasive barriers to this because of having multiple jobs, childcare problems, lack of access to technology. But in the world that we live in, it's quite likely that lowering barriers to engagement will also further facilitate involvement by people who are wealthier, more educated, living in better neighborhoods. So I urge us to think about scenario-based planning to try to figure out how to be explicit about whether we're designing solutions for that third best world or for something of a more perfect uh, world. Last but certainly not least, what seems like a very desirable equilibrium is one where we have the civic benefits of an internet that is almost liquefying, that is becoming more adaptable, more scalable, more sort of crawling with autonomous or semi-autonomous agents, cheaper computing power and so on. And all that flexibility and scalability to design educational solutions or to figure out how to engage people or to protect us from misleading ads and not have to face the darker, more difficult consequences of that liquefying of the internet. But obviously the reality we're much more likely to be navigating is a long continuing and never entirely finished struggle to align those benefits with the desires and the goals that we have, the ambition we have for society without having to experience the risks of misuse and the various ways that these technological changes are going to create more risks and unexpected developments, or maybe even expected but undesirable developments that we just as soon like to avoid. It's not unlike what's in store for us, I suspect, when we try to retain the benefits of enormous mobility across 
borders, across continental divides, and global supply chains and travel networks while keeping at bay the public health and geopolitical risks that are now all too familiar. But as I think about that challenge against the backdrop of these projects, I find that a challenge that is inspiring and worthy of all of us who are gathering today. So with that, back to you, Betsy. Thank you so much, Justice Square. I think it's uh, incredibly important to think about the context that we're in right now and how it relates to these projects. It feels like there's a lot to be done. And so I hope that we've brought some beginnings of practical solutions. But if the audience leaves with anything today, I hope it's that uh, there's plenty more to do. So come help us do that. Uh, we'd like to bring all the panelists up uh, so that we can answer a handful of your questions. Of course, with three projects today, uh, we're only gonna be able to do so much. Um, but so first I wanna go to Elizabeth and Matt. Um, how have you uh, thought about the definition for political ads and how does it include uh, sort of the different aspects of internet virality? So would your regulations apply to a meme that organically becomes viral but also happens to help a candidate? So over to you. Sure, I can start. Well, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, that's a great one. So there actually are different variants of ads that the Federal Election Commission already regulates. Some of them are paid and some of them are unpaid. Uh, this is, a, if I remember correctly, a public communication and an electioneering communication. So um, our draft regulation does actually touch on that as well. If something is viewed too many times, it triggers this electioneering communication definition that doesn't require any payment. So absolutely, I think they should be regulated. Elizabeth, feel free to add anything. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with that. Um, I think the biggest thing that we want to get across is that there's lots of very specific regulations for anything that's basically not online. I think one of the definitions, I don't remember if it was public communication or election communication, but it's basically anything that has been paid for that has been put on someone's website, um, which is very vague because if I didn't pay to put a meme on a website, but it's still advertising for me, does that benefit me? Um, yeah, so it's complicated, but that's kind of what we're hoping to accomplish is to make it more specific and tailored to the modern era. Fantastic, thanks so much. So next I'd like to turn to Jessica. So your project discusses automated advocates in the legal context, but what other uses have you thought of for automated advocates that you could be excited about? And how do you imagine your project uh, leading to those uses coming to fruition? Thanks, so I'm incredibly excited about this, pro this question because actually the initial concept around automated advocates is something we saw happening not in the legal context. So we saw it happening in the civic technology space. I would say we saw it happening when it came to helping people to fill out applications for benefits, for example. And an example that's a case study on the site is actually a tool called Get Calfresh, uh, as well as a tool to allow people to check their benefits levels for SNAP programs that's called Propel, um, Fresh EBT. And so you could see it in that category. You could also see it, I talked about using it for us as citizens, but it can work for us as consumers. And there are tools out there that actually will do things like a flag when you see individual parts of a contract, when you check the terms and services on a given website and actually go and file for all of the access to your data and changes in the terms to make it more pro-consumer pro and then aggregate up that information to report it back out to encourage companies to have better practices when it comes to privacy and security. So those are some examples of areas that you could see it spread. I definitely believe as a field, it's broadly applicable beyond just the legal space. Fantastic. Thanks so much. So the next question goes to Amy. In your presentation, you talked about expanding people-powered policy beyond the city of Oakland. How do you imagine that happening? And what makes you think that this sorts of, these sorts of characteristics can expand to new cities? Hmm. Well, I think in the city of Oakland in particular, they have an office of race and equity um, that they're kind of leading with. Um, and I think they've been a, a great partner with this. Um, so I think um, we I think we all have to realize, I think in, in lots of agents um, or in local organizations and governments across the country are asking the same similar questions is how do we deal, make a more equitable city? So um, I think um, a lot of the things that we laid out was very um, 
very specific, not just specific to Oakland. It can be um, any, any local government can pick it up and start thinking about how might they, um, they start, um, start doing virtual participation. We have a couple of case studies, quite a few case studies in there, so they can see uh, other jurisdictions that are doing it. So I really think that um, this is not just, um, just specific to Oakland. They have to look into their own, do their own equity research and to find out like what does equity mean for their local jurisdictions. But I think, I think in, the, in the end, like this can be used across the board um, in any organization that really wants to make that change happen. Fantastic. And briefly to Justice Quayer, could you talk just a little bit about where you see tech policy, like the projects we've launched today, making the most impact in our justice system? I think the reality of our justice system is it's sort of got the promise of being inclusive and providing court access to everybody. But the reality, particularly on the civil side, as Jessica knows, is we have a long ways to go. We have millions of cases just in California's courts and so many vast numbers of pro se litigants. And we're not just talking about people contesting parking violations, although that is uh, obviously to some people more important than, than you might think. We're talking about elder abuse. We're talking about housing. We're talking about difficulties involving environmental justice. We're talking about difficulties involving forfeiture. We're talking about difficulties involving land use, democracy, local government participation, and uh, fees and fines and so on. And that reality is one that we just have not dealt with uh, sufficiently. So. I see this as um, this whole approach as being about orienting people so they can navigate the legal system better, so they can know where to go for help initially, so that they have just more basic familiarity with court procedures. But medium to long term, we have all these areas of life, medicine, law, education, that depend on bespoke expert knowledge and the promise of trying to democratize access to that knowledge, making it more universally available is incredibly exciting, even if it's also daunting and difficult. Fantastic. And so I want to turn to all the panelists. Um, so I always ask for you to give your bumper sticker. What do you want people to take away? But we have a special question from the audience, which is, how can we attendees help advocate for these amazing projects? So if your bumper sticker can speak to that, that would be fantastic. So I'm just going to go down the line here. So I'm going to start with Amy. Okay, um, one of the things I think about in my bumper sticker is that people should be at the center of policy and with technology, um, and that's, and empathy is at the center of that. Great. What about you, Elizabeth? I think the bumper sticker for us is that dark ads are a problem, but we don't know how bad it's, it really is until the federal government helps us figure that out. Great. Jessica? Tech should be on your side. And access to justice is a civil rights issue. Uh, and so make tech work for you. Fantastic. What about you, Matt? Mine is go vote. Disinformation is a problem online. There's a reason these draft regulations haven't been changed since 2006. Fantastic. And Justice Quayer, what about you? Oh, I love the question. I was trying to think, formulate my thoughts. And initially, I came up with possibilities that were just way too wordy for a bumper or stipper. I came up with things like, are you in a first best or second best world? Tomorrow will be less and more like today than you expect. And then I just <laughs> stopped. So um, expect better than we have today, but balance ambition with realism. Fantastic. Those are great words on which to end. So I want to thank the fellows, Justice Cuellar, Sevilla, Maddie, Javier, Carner, Beth, and the entire Aspen support team. I want to make sure that you know about our final webinar in this series focused on disaster resilience. That'll be on August 19th at 9 a.m. Pacific, and it features keynote Carlos Castillo, who just left FEMA as the acting head of resilience. Um, our presentations will focus on climate change and post-disaster response. So check out our products on aspentechpolicyhub.org. And thanks again for joining. Looking forward to seeing you next time. Have a wonderful day.